Good afternoon, everyone. This is Professor Dunham, and I'm going to be talking about chapter two and three today. This is week one, and I'm going to start out by going over some of the um, key terms right out of your textbook. Okay, well, let's go to chapter two in your textbook. And let's go ahead and dive in to chapter two. Okay. Chapter two is mainly about anatomy and physiology of the reproductive system. So we're going to talk about the, mostly the embryo and the external os. Um, we have a couple hormones, follicle stimulating hormone, again, that's put out by the brain, internal loss, luteinizing hormone, menarche, which is the first period um, that a, a little girl will have, a young lady will have, menopause, and um, ovulation is important, ovum, and oxytocin, that's the medication that stimulates you during contractions. And you'll need to know that all the way through maternity. We'll see it a lot. And puberty, the rugae, sem um, semen, and um, spermogenesis, and a zygote. Okay, so those are your key terms to chapter number two. So let's go ahead and let me bring in my screen, and we will start discussing chapter two. Now here we are, chapter two, and um, basically, let's let's get rid of this. Okay, so what we're looking at here is chapter two and chapter three. Um, so let's look at the anatomy and physiology of the of the reproductive system of the female. So you have what we call the mons pubis. That's a fatty uh, pad that lies right over the interior surface of the sympathous pubis. The labia majora is two rounded folds of fatty tissue covered with skin that extend downward and backward from the mons pubis. Now their purpose is to protect the inner vulva structures, which is good because young ladies you know, young um, uh, go out there and they're out there on, on the football field and they're playing and you don't want anything to hurt the reproductive um, system. Labia minora, you have this, these are two flat reddish folds and they're composed of connected tissue and they're smooth muscle and which are supplied with nerve endings. Now, again, the labia minora is extremely sensitive. Now I like this term, it's called the forche which is the obstetrical perineum. It's a thin flat tissue that's formed by the joining of the labia minora. Then you have the clitoris, which is a small structure underneath. The um, prepotens com compose of erectile tissue. Okay. And then you have the vaginal vesicle, and that's an almond-shaped area that's enclosed by the labia minora that contains the opening to the urethra. The perineum, the area between the anus and the vulva. So let me go here to my diagram and show you here. So you can see, starting at the top, when we talked about the mons pubis, okay, right there. And then coming down, you've got the clitoris. And over here, you can see coming down, I'm going to come straight down here. This is your urethra. And then you have the vagina, and then you have your labia majora. See how that skin it had a lot of protect to protective tissue. Then you have the labia minora, which you're coming in. You see here, yeah. See, it's, it's just much thinner than the labia majora, but it, it is highly sensitive tissue. And then you have your opening for your vegetable glands and you have your bronchial glands, which lubricates the vagina. Then you have your forche or your obstetric perineum, okay? 
and then you have your anus. So when we talk about like an episiotomy, we're talking about in the perineum, we're talking about this area right in here. Okay. So you have, in your episiotomy, you have a midline episiotomy. Yeah, episiotomy goes straight, would be right here. Okay. Now, when they have a fourth degree episiotomy, it will go all the way back to the anal sphincter. Okay. So keep that in mind when we talk about labor and delivery and you know having big babies. When you have these large babies, and they're called macrosomic babies, when you have these big babies, you end up with a pretty good episiotomy. Okay. Now another form of episiotomy, as we mentioned here, could be your um, your um, bilateral here, right here. So it could be a lateral midline here. Your midline's here, bilateral. Okay. But we'll talk about that when we get to labor and delivery. Now, this is a really good um, drawing of the internal female, female reproductive organs. So here is your fallopian tube. So here's your ovary, and you have your cervix. Here's your uterus, okay? The bladder, and then the rectum, okay? Now you can see how the uterus is lying in the pelvis and is tucked way down. Now when she gets pregnant, the uterus will grow and it'll come out of the pelvis and grows into the, her abdomen, and then becomes an abdominal um, organ, okay? And the reason why I like this to show you is because the bladder, the bladder lies right underneath that uterus. So when a woman who is pregnant um, has a urinary tract infection, okay? And she, um, you know, complaining of burning and frequency or urgency, and she's not feeling well, this bladder becomes inflamed. And then it puts pressure on the uterus. It can make the uterus contract. And she could go into premature labor because of this. All right, so keep it in mind when we talk about complications during pregnancy. And premature labor is one, and we don't want her to have this. <clears throat> we don't want her to have a UTI at all during pregnancy. And because the way a woman is put together, we're complicated human beings, um, a woman can come down with a UTI very easily, okay? So we want her to drink her water and we, you know, we'll test her urine every time she comes into the clinic to make sure she doesn't have any WBCs or nitrates. Okay. Now let's talk about a very important organ, the, the uterus. So you can see it's a hollow muscular organ. It's made up of three different muscle fibers and they all <clears throat> are intertwined. And that's how, by them being that way, that's how they are able, that's how the uterus is able <coughs> to contract, I mean, and not fall apart to get, you know, to get larger. Okay. So when you have a fertilized ovum, it implants and develops into an embryo <clears throat> and then goes, implants in the uterus, okay? The uterus is shaped like an upside down pear, absolutely. So next time you go to your grocery store, look at a pear and just turn it upside down. You can see where the, the end of the pear stalk, it looks just like here, and then you have the pear. All right, and like I said, it lies between the urinary bladder and rectum above the vagina. It is vagina right here. Now it's supported by the following ligaments. You have the broad, round, cardinal, and uterosacral. The big round ligaments are usually the ones that cause a lot of discomfort to our patients. Okay, the uterus is very um, sensitive to, and um, it has a lot of sense, uh, sensory motor and a lot of nerve roots, supply, sensations, 
to the uterus. There's a lot of nerves down in that area. And that's why pain management is important during labor because labor is pain. Okay, we're gonna move on. This is another really good drawing right out of your book. And you can see here, there's your uterus. <coughs> Excuse me. And the top of the uterus is called the fundus. The top of the uterus is called the fundus. And this is the fallopian tube. And here's your, you know, like I said, that fembre right here. These are like little fingers looking thing, you know? And so it's really cute how this will reach to the ovary and grab that mature um, follicle. And then that mature follicle will, will be released. And this frambre will, will catch it. And then it will find its way up the fallopian tube. Now, when it gets around here, if she, um, she, she's during ovulation, she's very fertile. And then you have all these sperms that are gonna be making their way up the vagina and into the uterus. And they have is a, is a sense of smell. And the sperms can actually smell that uterocyte. That's what it's called, an uterocyte. And she's just sitting over here. And then all these 500 trillion sperms try to, try to get in there. And, you know, a lot of them don't make it, but there's always just takes one sperm to get into that uterocyte or ovum and fertilize. So this is where fertilization occurs. So write that down. Fertilization occurs in the fallopian tube. And actually the place where it's, it does occur is called the ampular, A M. P-U-L-L-A. Okay. And then after fertiliz fertilization, it's going to now keep going. It's going to travel through the fallopian tube. It's going to go over under, you know, my mitosis, you know, that process where it's going to cell divide and multiply. And then it gets to here and it's still growing. It's still multiplying. It turns into a morella, and then it'll, as it enters into the uterus, it's going to turn into a blastocyst. And the blastocyst will find its way to implant, and implantation occurs in the upper portion of the uterus, okay? Right, write that down, of the uterus, and it's gonna burrow down in the endometrium. Now the endometrium is the lining, the inner lining of the uterus, endometrium. And during this time now, it's rich, it's very vascular and is very rich and is ready to take that blastocyst and let and accept it and get burrowed down in there, so then it would start to grow. So we have two very important concepts. We have fertilization and we have implantation. All righty. And I would, again, look at here. See, look at this broad ligament. You can see that this ligament is the same, it's the same size holding up this thing uterus when it, she's not pregnant it doesn't get grow any larger during pregnancy and when this uterus gets bigger this uterus can put a lot of pressure on the broad ligament and cause her to have pain usually they complain of pain going down their groin going down to their leg okay so you know and when you have a chance look at this again so you have a good idea of when we talk about the vagina and the cervix, because this is what we we check when we're checking in the labor room. Um, during labor, we check to see if she's dilating her cervix. Okay, but for right now, I want you to take note to the fundus and write that term down, because that's another important term, the fallopian tube, okay? So you have those. Now the morphine gland, these are, glands that secrete mucus 
and it keeps the vagina nice and lubricated. So we talked about the cervix, which is your neck or lower portion of the uterus. We talked about the cervical canal. In the cervical canal, there's two osses. You have the internal os, which is located um, really near the cor uterine corpus, okay? Then you have the external, which is, so that means it's higher up. And then you have the external os, which is opening into vagina. And that's the lower one. So let me go back here. So say you have the osses. So you have the internal loss, which is higher up in here. And then you have your external loss down by your cervix. And a lot of times, um, you know, when you're doing, doing your um, labor checks, it's, which is a ster sterile procedure, a lot of nurses will get, will not, will not check correctly because they're they're actually only hitting the external loss you have to go up a little higher and get that internal loss now your mucus lining has four functions okay so remember here the Bartholin glands well we want to keep this all really the vagina really good and lubricated so the, it lubricates the vagina and mu mucus actually because it's thick it actually acts as a bacterial static agent, keep out, you know, unwanted bacteria. And then it provides an alkaline environment to shelter deposit sperms. When those sperms come in, if they don't die off, they're able to get through. And then don't forget you have the sperms and they have to come during intercourse, they come through the vagina and they have to make their way. And this is going uphill. So they have to be really good swimmers. And that's called motility of the sperm. And they come up into the uterus and they're gonna make their way all the way through to the fallopian tube and here in the um, one third of the fallopian tube, which is called the ampular, they're going to fertilize. Alrighty. Now we talked, uh, here's a mucus plug. Um, the mucus plug serves, um, it's in the cervical canal, and it's right in here. It's not really, you can't see it too good here. It's right there. And what that does, that um, make, it, it protects the woman from getting bacteria up into the uterus during pregnancy. All right. Now, let's just, I want to go over this concept with you because um, it's important. So the fallopian tubes, and so you have a good, Picture in your mind now the fallopian tube, and that's your passageway for the sperm to meet the ovum. So you want to probably remember that. So keep that in mind. Again, it's a passageway. All right. Then we said it was a site of fertilization. Absolutely. That's where fertilization occurs. And it's nice because it's a really safe and nourishing environment for the ovum or the zygote, you know? You know, these tubes in here, when the fertilization occurs in the fallopian tube, they're safe. They're not, nothing's going to harm them so that the oocyte and the sperm can come together and make fertilization. Again, it only takes one sperm to fertilize the ova. Once the ova is fertilized, she puts out like an aura around her. And she's very smart that way because. She keeps out anybody else. She says only one, only one is the lucky winner. Okay. And then the fallopian tubes, they act as a transporting ovum or zygote. This here, the fallopian tube, it helps move along the, the little zygote, which remember it becomes fertilized here. Then it has cells and multiplies. It becomes a zygote. And then from the zygote, it travels through and becomes a morella here. And still, as it, just before it enters into the uterus. Okay, all righty. Now, the thing I want, I told you about the ampular, that's the section of the fallopian tube that fertilization occurs. And then I told you about the fembrae, which is finger-like projections. All right.
you have the bony pelvis. So you have two parts and um, you have the um, bone sacrum and coccyx and it protects the her pelvic organs. That's what the pelvis is all about. And also the pelvis does form the birth passageway. Now this is important to remember. So write this concept down. You have different types of female pelvises. There's four different types. You have the gynecoid, the android, the um, anthropoid, and the platyoid. Now, the one that's most favorable is the gynecoid, okay? Um, the one that's unfavorable for vaginal delivery is the platyoid. And you can just see from the shape of these pelvises that this would be very hard to get a baby's head through. Baby is circular, okay? And you need to have room, ample room. So here, you can almost see how nice that would be. All right. Now, if I ask you a question that, um, and see how you would answer. The nurse is teaching a health class about the four times of female pelvises. Which pelvis is optimal for the passage of the fetal head? And the right answer, of course, would be gynecoid. Okay. Now, I'm going to just tell you the android is the male pelvis. And yes, some females do have an android type pelvis, which is not really good for a vaginal delivery. Okay. All right. So that ends chapter two. All righty. Now, chapter three is on fetal development. Now, um, we're going to talk about gamete genesis and human reproduction and human fertilization implantation and embryonic development and describe fetal development. All righty. I always like to see the objectives and see what we're going to discuss during the time. And, you know, we are who we are through our DNA. You know, you have 23 chromosomes from mom, daddy and you have 23 chromosomes from mommy making a total of 46 chromosomes and you are who you are, okay? Okay, you get it from your parents. Now, my in cell division, we have two. We have um, the first here is called mitosis and that's the division and multiplication of body cells. Remember, it is a continuous process. Once that um, fertilized ovum starts to travel through the fallopian tube, remember, that's it, it's, it's cell divides. It keeps dividing and multiplying, dividing and multiplying. And as one, one piece of the um, cells dies off, it gets replaced. And so it keeps going. And then um, you have the process of mitosis for the cell division and multiplication and for the sperm is called sp spermogenesis. And the process of, of cell dividing and multiplying for the ovum is called oogenesis. Okay, now meiosis is the process when taking place in the sex cells. So each one has one sex cell. So you have reproductive cells undergo two divisions. So you have the number of chromosomes, which is 23, right? with only one sex chromosome, okay? And that's called a haploid. So at fertilization, the new cell contains 23 chromosomes from the sperm and 23 chromosomes from the ova. All right, and the formation of these gametes by this type of cell division, which is meiosis, is called gametogenesis. Now, each gene in your body was coded for inheritance. So again, remember I told you that DNA hel helix. So everything, you are who you are. And so genes carry instruction for dominant and receptive trait. And we talk, when we get into a little bit more about genetics, um, you'll, you'll see um, the dominant and recessive genes. And dominant, just remember, usually overpowers recept receptive, okay? Sure, dominant, just the way it sounds dominant, and then it's passed on to the offspring. So it's always good to know what happens. Now this comes right out of your book, and this is on cell division and gametogenesis. And we know what that is because we just went over it. So you can see here 
the what happens and from the sperm, and then what happens from the um, ovum. So this is oogenesis and this is spermogenesis. And so what you can see here that you have the sperms and how they what they do is they they mul they multiply, divide and multiply, divide and multiply. And same here with the oogenesis, and you can see how it, it does. So like I told you before in chapter two, the fertilization occurs when a sperm penetrates an ovum and they unite. It takes place in the outer third of the fallopian tube near the ovary. So it takes place and that's called the ampular. And um, so as you can imagine, the, um, the over, ovum um, or the, yeah, the egg is released from the ovary and it gets grabbed on by the little finger, finger projections and then it makes its way, okay? And then if there's a whole bunch of sperms and they're coming, she has intercourse and it's time of ovulation. She is now very fertile and she will get pregnant. Alrighty. So here's a great, great diagram. I love diagrams. So here's your follicles and you have it matures. And when you have a mature follicle, it's released. And then here's your fingerprint fingers. And they're, and they're grabbing onto them. And here's the oocyte. And so here, this is day zero. This is now one little sperm gets in. And so now it's fertilized. And so this here will go under massive cell division, multiplication cell division as you saw in those previous slides. And then you have your zygote, okay? And then again, it keeps cell division and it keeps traveling. It's a little zygote and she gets about right to this stage here. You can see a whole bunch of different cells and um, you, it now turns into what we call a morella. And then she makes his way into the uterus and finds a place, becomes a blastocele. And again, there's lots of cell division going on. And um, the, you know, the neural tubes, uh, you know, the baby is actually being formed. And so this is why it's so important that she takes that folic acid um, to make sure that the embryo, you know, is going to form correctly. So this blastocyst finds its way into the uterus and will burrow down, and that's called implantation. So here's another picture of it too, okay? Same thing, your, mature, your follicles, and here she has all the follicles, all the, she's born with all the ovas that she's going to ever have, she's going to um, be born with. Okay. All right, so then, that's released, and the little fingers grab it. And here's your other side in the tube. And here is she's fertilized. See all the different sperm thing. Only one gets in, and all the other ones are just bye bye. And then he turns into a zygote and two cell cell division. Um, and then this this is called in here. This is called cleavage, where you can see that it's cell dividing multiplying and cell dividing again here. Here, here's your morella. It goes into the uterus, becomes a blastocyst and finds its way to the upper portion of the uterus on the posterior wall and burrows down, which is called implantation. All righty. Now, sex determination. So sperm from daddy, Carry can carry either an X or a Y chromosome. So the male actually determines the gender of the fetus. And the pH of the female reproductive tract influences survival rate of the X and Y bearing sperm. Okay. And XX results in a female, and XY results in a male. And like I said, the gender of the baby is determined by the father's sperm. All right. It is sometimes the conception and birth 
uh, of a child of a certain sex is a source of concern to some families and some cultures. All right, and then the, the zygote, after it's, you know, it's called a zygote because it's formed by the union of sperm and ovum. And after fertilization, the zygote travels through the fallopian tube into the uterus from implantation. Got it? And then during the transport, the zygote actually undergoes rapid meiotic division, and that's known as cleavage. Okay. Now here we have a great um, drawing of what I call fetal maternal circulation. And I'd like to point out the different layers of the uterus, the amion and the chorion. Here you have the umbilical cord, okay, placenta, and you can see the spiral arteries. Now this maternal side of the placenta is called the Duncan, called the dirty Duncan, because it does, it looks, it's not pretty at all, has these little lobes to it, but it's very necessary because these spiral arteries are all what? Gonna, this is the transport of gonna be of, of oxygen and blood from mommy to the fetus, okay, the placenta. Okay, placenta is very, very important. Here you have a picture of the um, mucus plug, and you can see how that would keep out a lot of germs and bacteria out of the uterus. And here's your uterine cavity. Now the morella is back up here, as you can see. It's been going under a lot of cell division. And so it enters the uterus about the third day. And then the morella, She's gonna float in, in the uterus for a little bit, about two to four days to find this great place to, <coughs> to implant. And then it becomes the blastocyst. So what happens, there's two distinct layers, layers that are evolved. You have the inner layer, which is a solid mass of cells, okay? Which is your blastocyst. And, develop, and then you have you develop into embryo and embryonic membrane. This is where it's so important that she's on that folic acid. Then the outer layer is the trophoblast, okay, the outer layer. Kind of, it's kind of like a membrane. And that will, that trophoblast actually develops into the embryonic membrane called the chorion. And it just went over the chorion and the amion. Okay. Implantation of the zygote is usually in the upper section of the posterior uterine wall. Again, it burrows down. You ever see anything, you know, like an animal, they burrow, they, they can get into places and it just, they just are out in there, you know, they're making a way. And that's what happens when you have the blastocyst looking for a good place to burrow down in the endometrium in order to keep growing, cell dividing, growing, turns itself into an embryo, okay? Now the endometrium, which is the inner line of the uterus, when she's pregnant, turns what, another term called the decidua, and that's D-E-C-I-D-U-A. So the area under the blastocyst is called the decidua um, um, basilis, like a base, a base, B-A-S-A-L-I-S, -S, okay? And that's just where he's borrowing down into. And actually everything is very well used because that becomes maternal side of the placenta. Okay. So I want you to remember what implementation is the term that's used to describe the process of a fertilized, as fertilized a attaching to the wall of the uterus during early pregnancy. Now, is this is all very early, you know, in the pregnancy, and a lot of times um, women are not even aware that they're pregnant at this time. And it's such an important time because, you know, she could be smoking, she could be drinking, taking drugs, um, taking things what we call terogens, which are harmful for the growing embryo. And so, you know, every baby is a little miracle because a lot of times mommies are not, you know, they don't know that they're pregnant at six weeks, okay? 
They just don't know yet. All right. Now, this is just a little shot of the developments and it shows you the chorion, the amion. Here's the yolk sac and your primary germ layers we're going to talk about. This is, again, is cell division. And the differentiation of the cells. Everybody has a job. So your chorion develops from the troboblast, which is the outside of the blastocyst, and it takes in the amion, the embryo, and the yolk sac. Okay, and we're back in here. The amion, the yolk sac, right? Okay, and the little embryo. Going back here, here's your embryo, here's your yolk sac, and here's your amion. Okay, so that's your chorea. Okay, now the thick is a thick membrane, has projections called villi, and these villi will actually go into the decidua basalis on the uterine wall. So remember, the situa basalis is the basics where that blastocyst went ahead and burrowed down into the endometrium. And remember, the endometrium became the decidua. And the chorion forms the embryonic fetal portion of the placenta. <coughs> the amion. The amion, excuse me very much. The amion is the second membrane. So these membranes are protecting <coughs> the embryo. So together, the chorion and the amion form the amniotic sac. These two, the chorion and the amion, form the amniotic sac. And the amniotic sac is your bag of waters. This is where the baby is going to grow and live for the next nine months. Amniotic fluid is really important. It's usually clear. Well, it is clear, not usually. I shouldn't say that. It is clear. It has a mild odor, not a pungent odor, very mild. And it contains bits of vernix or langugo. And vernix is... It's called vernix cassiosa. And what that is, is very thick cold cream. And that covers the entire body of the fetus. And, and it protects his skin. Langugo is the tiny hairs that grow and protect the baby's skin also. Protects the baby. Imagine your baby is laying in water, fluids, for nine months. And the skin has to be protected. Otherwise, the skin would just peel right off. All righty. So the functions of the amniotic fluid is very important. This is an important concept. So I want you to take note of this and please write it down. It maintains an even temperature. Babies can't be in cold water. Uh, otherwise, they wouldn't be able to grow. They can't be in real hot water because they wouldn't be able to grow. They have to have an even temperature. So the mom's body is very important that she keeps a even temperature. Okay, makes sense. So that's why you don't want them moms to go into a hot tub. It would in, it would increase her internal temperature way too high. That's why we don't want them to be running marathons and getting overheated. Again, the same thing. So you can be very careful to maintain mom's temperature in order to protect the fetus. Um, another important aspect of a function of the amniotic fluid, it prevents the amniotic sac from adhering to the fetal skin. So he's laying in the bag of water, just thinking he wasn't, didn't have any fluid around him, then his skin could actually maybe adhere to the amniotic sac or vice versa. So that wouldn't be good. You have to have a barrier. And then the amniotic sac, because this baby, and don't forget, it's growing inside. So you want it to grow evenly. We call that symmetrical. And so the amniotic fluid allows that growth to be symmetrical. 
Also, the amniotic fluid allows buoyancy in fetal movement, okay? So when mom feels the baby move, she can actually feel the baby move because she can, you know, inside and it allows the baby to jump up and down. Again, it, it's necessary because if you didn't have the fluid, um, baby wouldn't do very well at all. And that's what we have to worry about. A woman that has low fluid line is called oleohydrominose. And we worry about those women with very low amniotic fluid. Now, again, another function of the amniotic fluid, it acts as a cushion to protect the fetus and the umbilical cord from injury. So we have to protect, but don't forget, you know, Ma, it, she's got a, a growing uterus and it's now, it's beyond 10 weeks. It could be 12, 14 weeks. And so now the uterus is in the abdominal cavity. And there's, you know, there's layers of skin. You know, of course you have the baby in the amniotic fluid, which is protecting him from injury, okay? And the cord has to be protected from injury because you don't want mom, if mom's in a car wreck, that you want some, you know, availability for this to be cushioned, the fetus to be cushioned so the fetus doesn't get harmed. Um, and that's why buoyancy is important is because if mom does get injured, then the baby will bounce inside more and not get harmed. Okay, and we do protect the umbilical cord too. We have Wharton's jelly that's around the umbilical cord to keep that safe also. So again, this is an important um, concept. I want you to write down functions of amniotic fluid because you'll see this again. All right, the yolk sac. So remember you have the ninth day of fertilization. You've got this little guy in there on the ninth day. And he functions, um, and, he ha and this is his little lifeline, actually. This is how he's starting out with, with the little yolk sac to keep him going. And what it does, it helps produce red blood cells, okay? Remember, just this is a tiny little thing, and he's just about to grow. Then you continue until the fetal liver takes off about six weeks. And then the yolk sac is no longer needed, so the the umbilical cord now is there. And so the umbilical cord takes the yolk sac and then encompasses it in, in its, its um, formation. And the yolk sac then it, it just degenerates. Okay. Like I said, everything is used very well. Now you have, you remember the little zygo and he's in the blastocyst stage. So now you've got that little, you got the blastocyst, okay? And he's finding a way in the uterus. He may be, you know, looking around to find that upper portion of the posterior wall of the uterus, okay, to, to burrow down and to implant. Well, he has three primary germ levels to the embryo, okay? So you have the exoderm, the mesoderm, and endoderm. So this is on the embryo. So think of that little embryo. So his mesoderm would be like his true skin, his skeleton. This is all in just little bitty guy form. He's just being formatted, okay? Got bone and cartilage. Maybe have a little bit of connect connective tissue, muscles, blood and blood vessels are starting in kidneys and gonads. Again, this is the embryonic stage. This is week two through week eight. Okay, then you have the um, endoderm. And the endoderm would be the trachea of the embryo, the pharynx and bronchi, the lining of the digestive tract and lining of the bladder and urethra. Everything is formatted. And that's why if mom is not doing, she's not doing what she should do, eat well and, and not drink and not take drugs. I mean, she's, if she's doing you know, all that bad stuff, then this is going to throw that formation off. It does make sense. That's why we want to get women in to prenatal care. And next week we talk about prenatal care. We want to get them into prenatal care in order that we can get them on proper vitamins and folic acid. Would be wonderful if all women came in preconception. Now the ectoderm is your outer layer of your skin, oil glands, the hair follicles of the skin, nail, and nails and hair and external sense organs and mucous membranes on the mouth and anus, okay? 
Remember, it's your little embryo. Okay, so he's going to grow. So this is your stages of prenatal development. So you have your zygote. We talked about that. Again, it's a cell that's formed by union of sperm and ova. The embryo then, it, it takes form from second to eighth week of development. And then your fetus is your ninth week until birth. So that's how we start out. We start out a little zygote. And then from a zygote, we have cell division and maturity and go from morale to a blastocyst. And from a blastocyst, we go to an embryo. And then we go into all the different germ layers. The three different germ layers of the embryo starts to develop. Okay. And during that time, too, the neural tube actually will close. And if she has um, undernutrition. She's not taking folic acid. She's more prone then to an open neural tube defect. Okay. Now the fetus, and the fetus um, is determined. It's called fetal development. Class from the ninth week until baby's born. Okay. Even to forty weeks gestation, um, it's determined that the brain is still maturing. And then you have age of viability which is 20 weeks of gestation, okay? Now, the age of viability is important, and you might see that again. So in your book, it has, right in your book, is 20 weeks in this chapter of gestation of pregnancy. Now, this means viability, what it means is the ability of the fetus to live outside the mom's womb, okay, on his own, okay? He's able to live outside the mom's womb, all right? He'll have to go to the neonatal intensive care unit to really survive, okay? But anything below 20 weeks is non-viable. And so that means that baby could not survive outside of mom's womb. And that's what viability means. All right. So here we go again. You got your zygo. Then we're going to turn into, actually turn into a morella and blastocyst and then your embryo. All right. And here, it's just is really nice. It has the embryo at three, four, six, and eight weeks. So it shows you. Remember, the embryonic stage is week two to week eight. So here you can see the neural groove. Okay. See that here? Okay. And then you have the neural folds. And then you have... This is your part of your chorionic sac here, connecting stock. And then you have here your neural fold in the region of developing brain. So you see right here, if this doesn't close, okay, right? You could have a condition in the fetus called hydrocephalus, okay? If it doesn't close down the neural tube right through here, you could have a condition in the fetus at birth called spina bifida, okay? You can actually have the meningeal myelocele to be sticking out of the baby's back when he's born. So what, what will help that? I hope you're, you're replying back and telling me folic acid, absolutely. And what a, what a thing that was to see that red research, okay. So here's another drawing, shows you nine weeks. Mm -hmm. We look like a little shrimp here. That's when the fetal stage begins. I, like I said, it goes all the way to 40 weeks of station. And so as you can see here at 12 weeks, sex organs differentiate. At 16 weeks, the fingers and toes are developing. At 20 weeks, hearing. And if he's hearing, then he hears mommy's voice, mommy's heartbeat. And mommy talks and daddy should talk to the, feet, the baby. 24 weeks, the lungs begin to develop. We don't breathe inside in the, in the uterus until we're almost born, but the lungs have to develop. So 24 weeks, my, our lungs are just starting to develop. Then in 28 weeks, the brain, the brain starts to grow very rapidly. And then at 32 weeks, you got your bones fully developed. And then 36 weeks, muscles are fully developed. And 40 weeks is your full-term development of your fetus. Okay. Now here, 
you have this is a, a baby or an, um at 17 weeks and 25 weeks remember 17 weeks this little guy is non uh, viable okay he's below that 20 week and you can see why it would be non viable he's not he doesn't have it every it seems like he has everything there but it's not well developed okay all right it's just really starting to develop and then this guy is at 25 weeks and you can see the big difference. And that's why this little baby, even though he'd be very premature, because at 24 weeks, the lungs just start to develop, um, he would be in the NICU. Again, baby at 29 weeks, um, you can see here, they got a picture inside the uterus here. And here's your 36 weeker. All right. So now let's go on to lesson 3.2. These are our objectives. We're going to do, um, describe the development and function of the placenta, the umbilical cord, and amniotic fluid, compare uh, fetal circulation to circulation after birth, and just kind of look at the similarities and differences and the two types of twins. All right. Now the placenta. The placenta is a very vital organ. Okay, to this baby. It will supply everything baby needs. And it also will take away waste products and deoxygenated blood. Okay, so we want to make sure we understand about the placenta. There's two sides of placenta. You have the maternal side, which is your Duncan side. I remember I called it the dirty Duncan. That's because it has those little globes, you know, it looks really dirty. <laughs> It looks globule. And because don't forget, remember where that implanted? That implanted in that what? The sigua, the sigua, right? The sigua, and so in the endometrium attached to mom, mom, okay? And that's how things come through from mommy, through the placenta, to the through the cord to baby. Now the neonatal side is called the shiny shulls because that's what it looks like. It looks real shiny and real new. So you can think of that way too. New, neo, okay? Newborn, okay, new, shiny shulls, newborn. Uh, umbilical cord has three vessels. You have two arteries and a vein, and I call that AVA. Artery, vein, artery. Just one way you can always remember it. And so what we're looking at, circulation, so we have the two arteries. So the two arteries is where the fetal deoxygenated blood and waste products will come from the fetus. And it comes through the umbilical arteries and goes back to mom, okay. Now, how this little guy inside takes the oxygen and nutrients, right? It goes to the umbilical vein, the baby, all right. Well, let's look at this um, here. Let's look at our beautiful placenta. So you see the neonatal side. It looks new, don't it? Shiny Schultz, SS, however you want to remember it. Um, is it, it. You'll find your way, but this is the neonatal side. And the Dirty Duncan is the other side of the placenta. And again, that was implanted in mom. So um, it's attached to mom's wall for uterus and here's your core. The placenta is really necessary because it is an organ is an organ for fetal breathing, respirations, nutrition, and excretion. So you see why I said the placenta is very, very important. And the placenta has four hormones. It has progesterone, estrogen, HCG or human chorionic gonotrophin or human placenta glycogen, HPL. Again, placental transfer, fetal deoxygenated blood and waste products lead the fetus through what? Let me hear it. What did you say? I think I heard it correctly, two umbilical arteries. Okay. So fetal and maternal blood normally do not mix. Okay, we like to keep them separate. So oxygenated nutrient rich blood from mommy spurs into the you know, those intervillized spaces. Remember those spiral arteries I talked about in the decidua? 
that's how that oxygenated blood, nutrient-rich blood, gets from mom into the into the spiral arteries in that decidua, which is the basic lining. All right, and then fetal blood releases carbon dioxide and waste products, and it goes back through the vein. Okay. Here's another little picture of our little fetus. You can see his little heart in here, and everything's just starting really to grow. This is why we want to have mommy be eating well, having prenatal care, you know, get, learning, make sure she stays good, her blood pressure is good, and make sure she doesn't get sick and have ur urinary tract infection, make sure she's taking her folic acid so this his little neural tube will kind of close. All right, again, um, we were going to repeat placenta transfer. Remember, Ava, two arteries and one vein. And fetal blood takes oxygen and nutrients before returning to the fetus through the umbilical vein. And baby gets oxygen through the vein, nutrients through the vein. So you might want to make your own little concept mapping of this. And then you can put fetal deoxygenated blood, that means blood that's no longer oxygenated, and waste products come out of the fetus through the arteries. That's the best way to do it. Now that's what we said. Many harmful substances can be transferred to fetus because how it can be transferred, everything crosses the placenta, okay? Everything crosses the placenta. The only thing that doesn't cross the placenta, as I know, is uh, insulin, which is a large molecule, but everything else can cross the placenta, okay? And we call that um, transplacental. So here, getting back to the back to the placenta hormones, progesterone is really vital to a good pregnancy because it maintains the uterine lining. You know, we talked about the uterine endometrium. We talked about how the decidua ballast for, for the um, borrowing down of the blastocyst into the endometrium. You need that good, rich soil, I call it, which is blood for it to borrow down very well. So it, it needs to maintain the urine lining. All right, then you have another um, good thing because we say it maintains a pregnancy because it reduces uterine contractions. Um, the uterus is, is, is made of three different muscle fibers and will contract. And we have enough progesterone, it keeps it quiet for a while to prevent a spontaneous abortion. If a woman has recurrent um, ABs. You know, you take an obstetrical history and you find out she's had quite a few ABs and you find out, you know, how many weeks she got to. And then, you know, you might want to, this pregnancy, you don't want her to have another spontaneous abortion. We're going to get a blood test and we're going to see what level of progesterone and estrogen she has, especially the progesterone. I want to say, because maybe she has a, it's just a little low in order to keep that pregnancy we may have to give her progesterone injections. Now, progesterone also prepares the glands of the breast for lactation and stimulates the testes to produce testosterone. So that's progesterone and now estrogen. Estrogen stimulates you to grow. Estrogen, okay? Increases the blood flow to uterine vessels. It, it stimulates, it makes it grow. It stimulates the development of the breast ducts to prepare for lactation. So it makes things increase. Okay. Like down here, you may have increased skin pigmentation. You may have here some vascular changes in the skin and mucous membranes of the nose and mouth. A lot of times, you know, they have nosebleeds. And so that's our effect of estrogen. Um, extra saliva is estrogen. All right, another placenta hormone is HCG. This is the hormone that is picked up very early in pregnancy. And so this is what, you know, it's in those little first response pregnancy kits. And so you give a little urine sample. We put a few drops in, in the reservoir right there. And then, we'll, then we get our result. That's HCG, human gonotrophic hormone.
Then you have the human placental lactogen, which what happens is it decreases the insulin sensitivity and utilization of glucose by mom. It helps to make more glucose available to fetus to meet her, you know, the growth needs. And we'll, you know, well, as we study more about maternity um, um, and we get into gestational diabetes, we can talk about this because that has a direct effect on the human placenta lactogen. So remember your milk cord. Remember Ava. Okay, this is the, in the cord itself. There's three vessels, and we call that the lifeline between mom and fetus. It has two arteries and one vein, Ava. And the two arteries carry blood away from the fetus and one vein returns blood to the fetus. Yes, it is backwards from extra uterine life, um, but it's, it is, now we're talking about intrauterine life and this is how blood is circulated in intrauterine life. Um, Warchin's jelly I talked about, it covers and cushions the cord vessels. And then the umbilical cord usually protrudes right near the center of the placenta, um, near the center of the placenta, and I showed you that. All righty, let's go here. So here's a beautiful picture of a cord. The normal length is about 55 centimeters or 22 inches long. This is a real pretty cord, by the way. You can see it's nice and thick, it's big. A lot of good blood. New oxygen could get through this cord, okay, remember? And it's going to get to the fetus from mom, all right? So mom is, she's probably a very healthy lady, taking her vitamins, taking her folic acid, and giving all the blood, red blood cells to the baby, which carries oxygen and nutrients. So she's, you know, she's eating and feeding this baby very, very well, okay? And the, and the vice versa. The baby deoxygenated blood and waste products go from the baby through the cord, right? And back back up to through the placenta and get excreted in mom's system. All right. All right, let's go on here. Now, when we talk about circuitry shunts, um, this these are shunts that are necessary to keep the to keep this fetal circulation different in utero. So we have the foramen ovale, which is what? Which is an opening between um, the left and right atrium, the upper chamber of the heart. Then you have the ductus arteriosus, which is the fetal artery connecting the aorta and the main lung, okay? And then let me see here. And then you have the ductus arteriosus, which is a fetal artery connecting the eight order and the main lung artery. And the ductus actually allows blood to detour away from the lungs before birth. So you see, this is why we have these shunts. And these will close after, um, after birth. The ductus venosus is a shunt that allows oxygenated blood in the umbilical vein, okay? to bypass the liver. So here, I think I have a little picture here. And you can see here the foramen of valley between the right and left atrium. And here is your ductus arteriosus. Here's her aorta. And here is the umbilical vein. Here's your placenta. And you can see how this bypasses that liver and goes into up in the heart. Okay. Alrighty, so I did put here a circulation before birth. I put another one here and the blood enters your fetal body through the umbilical vein. About half goes to the liver and the remaining goes into the inferior vena cava through the doctors of cherry venosis. Then goes up into the uh, foramen of valley, which is between the right and left atrium and then out to the doctors of cheriosis. All right, then blood containing waste products is returned to the center through the arteries. All righty. Now, after birth, the foramen of valley between the right and left atrium, that will close within two hours after birth. The ductus arteriosus closes within 15 hours, per uh, uh, permanently about three weeks, okay? And then the ductus venosus closes functionally when the cord is cut. You cut the cord, baby, you're on your own, and then permanently about one week. Because remember, the ductus venosus is down here, 
see here. And so you want that to close pretty quick. All righty. Now, healthy intake during pregnancy will influence the development of the fetus. I have said that several times, and it is true, okay? So we want women to get prenatal care so we can know her his medical history, her surgical history, do obstetrical history, and then get her on a good diet, make sure she's getting all the nutrients, and make sure she's eating properly. And because she can be very fatigued, especially in the beginning of pregnancy, and make sure she's eating properly. Okay. Because if she's not, you can have um, permanent changes in the fetal structure. We talked about that. And physiology and metabolism can influence development of conditions such as heart disease and stroke in adulthood. And exposure to toxins in utero, never good, it can also influence health in later life. So intrauterine growth restriction may reduce the number of cells in the organs, not good, and can predispose to the development of specific diseases later in life. And we'll talk about that as we get more into newborn. And chapter 14 is on congenital anomalies. Now fetal growth can be best um, assessed when the weight and the length of gestation, how many weeks she is, okay, the placenta size and newborn head and abdominal circumference are considered. And when babies are born, we're looking at all of this. And fetal growth limited by, limited by nutrients and oxygen received from mom is not good. Okay. Then you can, then you know that there's going to be limited growth. Okay. Now a healthy mother can produce a healthy child who is less prone to illness. And that's what it's all about. This healthy people 2030. This is what we're all about here, trying to get healthy moms healthy. Healthy moms, healthy babies. That's why I always said healthy moms equal healthy babies. Uh, if, if, if somebody is under um, nourishment, um, nutrition, in utero it can result in permanent change. And I think I've just said this, so it's just another slide to show you how important it is for them to have proper nutrition. We want to prevent illnesses of the next generation, but this generation must focus on their own health practices. And years ago, you know, many years ago, they didn't realize how important nutrition was to the developing fetus. So then that those babies were born with some limitations. Then that generation, you know, found out that yes, you should be taking vitamins. You should be taking folic acid. And so that generation then had healthier, had healthier practices. So they always say, and then their offspring was healthier. So every offspring is healthier. People are living longer. And that's what we're seeing now is that people are, you know, really, I mean, they're really able to live a very long life and to get to be a hundred years ago back in like the 40s and 50s, living to 100 was never even heard of. But they always say, every generation gets better. It's because they learn from the previous generation. Now you have twins, multifetal pregnancy. It does occur once in every 90 pregnancies. And when home, it, it happens when hormones are used to assist with ovulation. Okay, so you say maybe she's having a tough time getting pregnant, and so she takes medication to enhance it, such as Clomid, and then she produces an extra egg, all right? And so that can occur. So when you have identical twins, though, they are formed from one single ovum, fertilized ovum, okay? One egg, okay? That's called a monozygotic. Now, the diazotic, and those are identical twins. I mean, it's hard to, to, to cipher out. And I have had um, students who were identical twins, and that was very difficult because they looked exactly alike. And they actually talked alike and acted alike. And it was very, it was, it was interesting. Um, diazotic twins is when there's two separate fertilized ovums, and that's fraternal. 
All right. And here I just have a little drawing of twins. And you can see here's your identical twins. You have one here. See the chuckle blast? See your cell division? Okay. This is in your blastocyst stage. Remember? Okay. So here you have the two eggs, two ovums. And they, and they, here they go. And they're going to both implant in the uterus. <coughs> Okay, this little guy was one, but he, he formed, he formed uh, two. Okay. okay, interesting. All right. So ask yourself, what hormone causes a positive pregnancy test? To see if you can answer that one on your own. What is the name of the hormone essential for maintaining pregnancy? What is the significance of the gynecoid pelvis? What is the implementation and where does fertilization occur? Answer those and, and you, you have now conquered this, these two chapters. All righty, I'm going to stop sharing. Oh, I think I have a little here. I'm going to play my video for you. Oh, let me see. I don't know. Let's see. I was. I don't think, oh, my computer is not strong enough. Okay, so take your time and to please watch this little video. It'll work on your computer a lot better. It goes over ovulation. All right, thank you very much. This is the end of my presentation. So I'm gonna stop sharing. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed week one, um, weekly review. It covered chapter two and three. Thank you very much. Be sure to answer those questions at the end.